while we're waiting, if, if you guys wouldn't mind putting down like what your business is, what you do, um, which part of Virginia you're in, I'd, I'm very interested to find out what the audience is made up of. Great. Mary, thank you for going first. I appreciate that with the Virginia Farmers Market Association. Someone's got to start it off. That's right. Get the ball rolling. Who else do we have out there? Hi. Do this all day, folks. Somebody's got to say something. Hi. Hello. All right. So I've got. Uh, Taboya, I hope I'm saying that right. Chesterfield, oh, you do herbal tea. Very fun. And Jill with cut flowers. And then Sylvia, the Piedmont ah. Pharmacy. Oh, I like the, uh, the pharmacy spelling it like farm. That's great. Thank you. All right. And Carol, you're looking at sustainable urban agriculture certificate programs. Very cool. All right. PR executive. Ooh, you're going to intimidate me, Kristen. Uh, just because marketing and PR, they go so close together. I have a small B and B, right? Grow more farms, Dan. Welcome. Mission driven. I like that. Are you a fan of Simon Sinek, um, Dan? Um, I know he's more start with why, but they all go together there. And Barbara with Timberwood Farm. Welcome. Another cut flowers, Rachel. Ethnic vegetable crops with Michael. Bryant Family Farm. You got beef and eggs, Rebecca. Thank you for coming. Michael with Africulture and Megan Clark with Thornton River Orchard Market. If I'm missing you guys, it's starting to go faster. So I apologize. Um, All Natural Livestock with Rich in Clark County. Well, I am so glad to have you guys on today. Duran, a peanut farmer. Ooh. Oh, nice. Michael, you want to get started? It's 105. Yes, ma'am. Yep, very good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Carter Jr. with Virginia State Small Farm Outreach Program. We welcome all of you all to this fourth part of our farmer market <laughs> preparedness series. Uh, it's been a great four seminars. We've learned a lot. It's been a lot of information gathered, shared, absorbed. Uh, and then we're looking to put those things we've learned and heard into action on this beautiful 75 degree day. Uh, we're all itching to get back out. I know I am to the farm and uh, <laughs> just started with some of my activities. Uh, so I won't delay anybody. So I hand it over to Dr. Tim Hudson of Virginia uh, Farmers Market Association. Tim. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. And welcome, everybody. This uh, is, as you said, it's the fourth in our series of Farmers Market Preparedness Workshops. Today, we're going to um, share how to craft and tell your farm story, how you can um, market and brand. You're going to learn about social media. In addition, you're gonna hear about different ways to market your business and what works and more importantly, what doesn't work in this new market reality, how things have shifted, et cetera, and what you can do in order to be able to get your product out there to the community. Just basic logistics. Um, we do have a chat box at the bottom. If you would go ahead and put all of your questions in the chat box, myself and my cohort with the Virginia Farmers Market Association, Mary Delicate, will be monitoring the questions and make sure that Emily gets those in a timely manner and can answer those. And we also are recording this. And so we will put this as well as Emily's presentation and any collateral materials from today up on our website and Mary Delicate will post that information in the chat box so that you will have access to this recording to be able to go as well as the presentation to be able to go back to and look at, um, and we should be able to do that by tomorrow or so by the time we get the, the recording, et cetera. And there also is a link for the evaluation for this program, which will be sent out soon from Virginia State University. We, and I know it's, um, it's just one more thing to do, but we highly encourage you to do it because is we base what our topics of conversation are literally on the feedback from you. I can either sit here in my office and determine what it is that you want to hear, or you can tell me what you want to hear and I can bring those topics to you. And I prefer to do the latter to make sure that I'm giving you what you need. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn the meeting over to our speaker today. Emily Davis is the owner and creative partner of Linkhouse Consultants a marketing agency that helps small business owners cut through the clutter and chaos of marketing and prioritizing their actions to achieve their business goals. With 
With over 10 years of experience in graphic design, marketing, and web design, Emily most enjoys working one-on-one -on -one with business owners to help them build a business they love. I will share before I turn it over with her that Emily has a long history of working with farmers markets and farmers. She is a longtime friend of the Virginia Farmers Market Association and does a lot of our work. And we could not do what we do um, with our website and our marketing without her, as well as many of the other um, farms uh, and farmers markets around the state. So um, she's a tremendous friend of the farmers and the Farmers Market Association. And Without further ado, I will turn it over to Emily Davis. Emily, take it away. All right, well, thank you so much, Kim. I appreciate the kind words. I love working with BAFMA. Um, so I'll actually go ahead and start my presentation here. Let me see, oh, can I get someone to give me screen sharing capabilities? Um, but, uh, you know, interesting fact about me is I grew up on a hobby farm in Oregon. Uh, it had llamas and alpacas, Jacob's sheep with like the five horns and um, and hazelnuts. Like I grew up on a, an old hazelnut farm. So it, uh, you know, I did not actually do chores or any of the stuff related with farms. It was my dad's thing, but uh, I always have a soft spot for being out in nature and people that are interested in that area. Do I have share screen ability? You do. All right. Wonderful. All right. So hold on just a minute. All right. Can you see it now? Looks good. All right. We're good to go. All right. So today we're going to be talking about story, specifically how to tell your story so that your audience will listen and then hopefully buy, because that's ultimately what you're, you're really looking for, right? Is you don't just want to make friends. You'd also like to make customers and, and have them help you either on with your mission, as some of you mentioned, or with um, helping your business to succeed. And what we're going to talk about today is the power of story to create connection, how to use your story to craft a meaningful message for your business. And then at the end, what I'd like to do is to have a hot seat workshop where I'll get some volunteers and we'll actually go through some of the things I talked about um, to help you sort through what I'm saying and see it in action. So hopefully that'll help all the rest of you. Um, and depending on time, we'll, we'll determine how many people we, we work through, but I think seeing it will, will help a lot. So a little bit about me. I told you that I did grow up on a hobby farm, but I am a graphic and web designer. I've been doing this for over 10 years and I am what's called a story brand certified guide. I'm also a Wix partner and I have been a VAFMA fan since 2016. But, you know, the real thing is that these are just facts about me, right? And so none of this really matters to any of you except where it intersects with your story. So, for example, anybody out there who has either had a Wix site or is thinking about building one may be like, oh, I might have some questions for her. Why is that button not working? Why can't I get the website to look the way I want? I just became interesting to you because of the fact that I'm a Wix partner. Um, any of you who uh, have had association with VAFMA have been participating there, then you'd be like, oh, I've seen Emily at a previous thing. That's interesting to me. And then if you're familiar with Donald Miller or with StoryBrand, you already know some of the points I'm probably going to talk about because there's that's a certain marketing framework. And so it becomes interesting to you because my story is now intersecting with your story. Because that's what the power of story really is. It's about connection. It's about getting us um, as humans to go from being separated to being together. Um, we're all familiar with stories. It's a common language used for thousands of years. And the reason that it continues to be uh, interesting to us is that they, hold on just a second. I gotta move something. Um, they emotionally connect with us. So think about movies. That's one of our favorite mediums for creating, for seeing story in, in the world today is movies. And about each of you can think of a movie that just really you feel attached to. And the reason you feel attached to it is usually because you've either felt what a character felt, their experience somehow mimics your own, or you find yourself wondering 
how would I behave in that situation? What would I do? And how, what does that make me as a person? And who do I want to be? Or maybe you heard the story at a pivotal moment in your life and it changed something for you, which helped to transform you. Uh, those all are part of the power of story about getting us to think about something outside of ourselves, connecting us together and helping us to recognize emotions even when we don't say them. All right, so I wanna do a quick exercise because I told you guys some facts about me. And so what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and write down some facts about you. So open up a Google doc, take a pen and paper, some sticky notes, whatever. But I want you to write down some facts about your business. So why was it started? I'm sure lots of you have very specific reasons. You can just do bullet points right now. Like why did you start your business? Uh, what need or problem was being addressed? by you starting your business or if you're thinking about starting one or if you're participating in an organization so whatever thing you're here today about what need or problem was being addressed and then what challenges have you faced and then who do you think the characters are in your story so i'm just gonna be quiet for a moment while you all think about this All right, so some facts about your business. Go ahead and put in the chat, if you will, like what year or decade did you start your business? How long have you been around? Twenty sixteen, Debbie. Jan started in twenty twenty. Ooh, nice and fresh. And Michael Carter, nineteen ten. Got twenty twenty from. Deborah, Rebecca's 2012, 2009 for Barbara, okay. 2019 with Kristen, Taboya, 2019, Cynthia, 1989, Piedmont Pharmacy, ooh, April 2020. That's an exciting time to start. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, 1649. Wow, Rich, are you a farm? I'm guessing. I'm really curious about this now, Rich. Okay, so as a family business started in Quebec and came down. Very cool. Um, all right, so that's a, that's a good fact about your business. You guys have lots of reasons why you started. Um, you know, the major pitfall that I see with businesses is that I think you're often told, use your story in marketing, use your story. And so we all start thinking about what's my story, what's my story? And we kind of do what we just did, which are the facts about our business. And you know, facts are very important because they, they, are, they are the facts, they are what happened. But the important part about story is not just the facts, it's the emotions that surround those facts that deeply influence us. Oh, this was another question. What does victory look like? We'll come back to that later. So let's start a little story about our family orchard. All right, let's call this Honeycrisp Farm. And I, I don't know what type of apples those are. I'm sorry. So if you are an apple enthusiast, um, I, I just like Honeycrisp apples. But um, if you're lying too heavy on facts, it's not going to come across as strong. So let's talk about Honeycrisp Farm. Uh, our families had this orchard since 1897. It was originally farmed by like Jacques Tully and he had, with his three sons. And while we were originally focused on lots of different types of orchards, in 1972, our family decided to focus only on the Honeycrisp apple and we still sell the best Honeycrisp apples today. 
right? So that is our family farm there. And, the, and those are facts. But as I said earlier, when you're thinking about facts, what's going to give you power in your marketing, no matter where you do it, social media, in person, on a website, um, at a chamber of commerce event, wherever you're using it, your story and those facts gain power when they intersect with your audience. And so we're gonna leave this example for a bit and come back to it later and talk about ways that we can strengthen it, all right? Okay, so now let's talk about the essential parts of a story. In his book, Building a Story Brand, Donald Miller talks about these different elements and they come back up over and over in stories that withstand the test of time. His favorite example is always Star Wars. That's something that a lot of people are very familiar with, but you'll see kind of the basic building blocks of a story if you think about the Star Wars series. So our hero in that story is Luke Skywalker, all right? He has a problem, which is that he needs to go rescue a princess who sent him a message and he, he she's got, been captured by the evil empire, right? So he has this problem. Well, he meets a guide named Obi-Wan Kenobi who helps him to make a plan so that they can go rescue the princess. And this plan is what ultimately results in success or failure. And if they fail, the stakes are catastrophic. Okay, so these are the basic elements. And if you watch Star Wars, you see all these different things go along. You actually see it repeated again in the next movie where instead of Obi-Wan, we now have Yoda as a guide. Um, and each character has their own story threads that follow this same similar pattern. Um, but once you start noticing it, you'll see it all over the place. When we start talking about the hero of the story, I'm going to tell you a little secret. It's not you. When people say that you should use story, your story in marketing, you're thinking, okay, I have to talk all about me all the time, but that's not really how it works because everyone is the main character of their own story. And so if you've ever been around someone who does nothing but talk about themselves, you usually lose interest pretty quickly because you're the protagonist of your story. And so you have wants, needs, and problems that you need to overcome. And their story only becomes interesting once it intersects with yourself. So as we start talking about how you're going to use your own story, you're actually going to take the position of guide. So that's a little sneak peek there. When talking about problems, this can be very hard for business owners um, to develop in their own, own brand story. Because what you need to do is as you're crafting all this together, you have to actually isolate one problem, which is hard because I know a lot of you are solving lots of different problems for people. So for example, if you take that farm that I talked about, that orchard really, with the Honeycrisp apples, you know, they could be producing apples that actually have flavor, whereas most superstore uh, produce doesn't taste like anything anymore because it's just pretty, it doesn't have flavor. Um, or maybe, but they're also at the same time, they're not using pesticides, they're organic, they're, they're using, um, you know, more, more environmentally friendly methods for actually raising the orchard. And they're making sure that they're not using things that are gonna kill off bees. I mean, there's so many different things you can be tackling at the same time. But as you simplify, your message gets stronger and stronger. And so when you're thinking about how you can create this narrative, this brand story for yourself, you wanna make sure that the problem is something you can help with. And so you're actually going to create this problem in the story, but create it in such a way that it's going to connect with the hero. You're going to have to try to pick one, but it's going to have multiple layers. Okay. This is your big bad. And if you've ever watched a movie where there's multiple bad guys, you know that things don't usually work out very well. I'm a superhero enthusiast. I'll admit it. Um, and so, you know, when I watch a superhero movie, like Wonder Woman 1984 just came out, they had two bad guys. It weakened the story. There was a Spider-Man movie, or well, there's been multiple Spider-Man movies where they tried to throw uh, several villains out there and it weakened the story. And it would have been better if they just focused on the one because it's hard for us to care about one thing really passionately when there's lots of different things vying for attention. And attention is what marketing is all about. You want to make sure that people know what to pay attention to so they can create that connection with you. All right. All right, so how do you 
best position yourself as a guide to work through these problems and, and help the hero of your story. I'm going to start with these questions. So get out a piece of paper again, and I want you to think through this. What do you love about your business? Because if we're talking about emotion, let's start with what's important to you. What makes you happy about your business? Why are you doing what you're doing? What do your customers love about your business? When people walk in the door or walk up to your stall or message you on Facebook, what sorts of things are they saying they love about you? And that's why they keep coming back with already existing customers. And what are they looking for? What kinds of questions do they ask when they walk through your door? So what are some things you love about your business? Go ahead and put one thing you love about your business in the chat. Mary loves the people that she works with. Michael, the freedom of your own land. Let's see, freedom, that's a very powerful word. Uh, Jill, we're able to continue farming on a century farm. Okay, so you've got some heritage there. Uh, loving flowers, Jan, you just love the whole experience with the color and the scent, the appearance of it. Um, love meeting the customers, talking about produce. Producing quality products, Barbara. Why is that so important to you? Why is producing quality products so important? Kim loves to serve the community. Debbie enjoys staying healthy. And Michael says, being able to farm the same land as my great, great grandparents. Is that heritage coming back up again? That, that family legacy, eliminating waste, um, people becoming interested in wellness. Okay, so taking some control of, of their, their health and learning the language of the land and share with others. Okay, so that connection to land, carrying on family work tradition. All right, so these are some really good reasons why you love your business. And as we keep going, you're gonna keep boiling this down just a little bit more. So people, when we are talking about problems, I mentioned that you're gonna have one problem, but it's gonna have multiple layers because when people walk in the door to tell you that, oh, I'm looking for this thing, or they walk up to you and say, I'm looking for some flowers today, right? They have an external problem. I need flowers because uh, it's my friend's birthday. That's an external problem. But the internal problem going on there is I want to show my friend that I care about them. All right, so that's that's one example. Um, a different type of external problem would be, um, let me see, I wanna lose weight. So going back to that wellness one, somebody says like, I, I wanna lose weight, but um, with, you know, Debbie or with, um, I was talked about wellness. Sorry, I'm flipping through this uh, to Boya. So if somebody says they want to lose weight, they have something internal going on about why they want to lose weight. Because if for different people, that'll that'll matter differently, right? Um, they may want to lose weight because they don't like how they look, or they may want to lose weight because of some other emotional struggle that they're experiencing at that time. But it's really about the wellness and about fixing that emotional problem before that external problem can really be solved. Uh, there's also a philosophical problem that will help you connect to these customers. So once you know they're external and they're internal, your philosophical is that thing that's going to tie it all together. And we like to say that this is the, the shoulds, like the world should be this way or shouldn't be this way. Your philosophical problem is uh, like with flowers, Jan, when you were talking about that, you know, the world should be beautiful or everyone should be surrounded by the beauty and fragrance and color of flowers because otherwise life is boring and life shouldn't be boring right so we have these strong emotions tied together with the philosophical problem and so again i know i'm going through things very quickly we'll workshop some of this at the end but as you're writing this brand story you're you're going to think about the problem you can solve for your customers on an external that's tied to an internal problem and then the philosophy about why you're the one that's going to solve that problem for them all right 
the important thing to remember is that people buy on emotion and then they justify it with language because if facts actually convinced people to do something we would all be doing the same thing because the facts don't change right like there are facts but there are so many emotions that surround facts uh, whether or not we believe facts are trustworthy is a big one um what where they came from um and whether or not it's an important fact because if all facts were equal how would we ever make a decision and i mean you can see this in your business too because sometimes you have to make decisions about is it more important that i be environmentally friendly or am i being economical and for different people you know economics weighs against being environmentally friendly differently depending on your own personally held values. And so you have emotion tied to the decisions you're making and your customers are the same. So anytime you have facts, we need to make sure we surround them with emotion, which is why you have external, that's the fact. But the emotional is that internal struggle that they're having and the philosophical is how you're going to harness those emotions. All right, so you're the guide and your job is to help establish empathy with the customer so you understand their problem because you've been there you know what they are feeling so when i asked you to think about why do you do what you do a lot of you your hero or the person that you're you're speaking to in this story is someone that's very much like you because they're going to have the same closely held values that you do in order to create that connection so when people um on the internet they talk about finding their tribe or you know their community it's because of this it's because of these shared values because you create that feeling of empathy and that makes them want to be around you um but you know this part is where your story goes because you establish that you know i once believed that all apples had to be flavorless too i'd never tasted one that had been grown locally and that i could actually go see the tree it was grown on. I'd, I'd never experienced that until I was 30 years old. And then I stopped by a farm and I had a real apple for the first time in my life. That's establishing empathy with someone who's only ever had bland apples, right? But you also, as a guide, have to establish that you have authority. Like, so I understand where you've been, but now I know more. I'm a guide. I, I'm at least a step ahead of you so I can show you a better way. I now know that in Virginia, you can get honey crisp apples that were picked only a week ago and they're going to taste amazing. And I know how to help you to get these apples too, right? So establishing yourself as a guide for people um, to help change and transform their world is very important. So let me go back through the list of what you guys all were doing here. Um, okay, so you have a lot of family farms. Uh, and so there's a reason that family farm, being on a family farm is important to each of you. But you need to boil down, why does that matter? Why does it matter to you so much? And how does that separate you from other organizations or farms? Um, and then how does that intersect with the people that you want to be your customers? Because that hero should be that customer that you want to clone, the person that, that you want to come back again and again and again, because you love working with them so much. Um, so where does your story intersect with theirs? How do you know how to help them? And why should this person trust you with their problem? Okay. Keep in mind that your story is only important as it relates to the problem of the hero. So the facts about the farm starting, uh, you know, 100 years ago, it's interesting, but it's more interesting and will stay with the customer when it actually matters to them. So for me and my personal story, you know, when I was asking when everyone's businesses started, 1649 was super interesting to me because I'm like, wow, there's probably a lot of story to mine out of a, a business that's that old. Um, but it has to be relevant because otherwise it's just trivia. It's just a fact. And people will find it interesting and then move on because it's not part of their story. All right. As I said, the point is to create emotion. And so you want people to feel something um, because they are doing business with you, working with you. They should feel like I'm top of the mountain. My life is going to get better. And the way their life is going to get better is you're gonna give them a plan. And I know a lot of you are probably thinking, well, what kind of plan can God give them? If I'm, you know, if I'm selling them a flower, 
why does that take a plan? And it's because we just, we live in a world where people want to know what to do next. We have so many messages. And so whenever you're communicating with people, um, helping them to know how to achieve the success that they want, and that success is going to vary depending on the problem, but telling them, just go ahead and telling them how to do it is so simple. And yet so many people miss it. Have you ever been to a website that doesn't even have a, a buy button? It's one of the most frustrating things if they have what you want. If they don't have what you want, you don't care if there's a button. But if they do, why won't they let you buy something? You know, you're just being like, take my money, please. Um, or, you know, putting it in terms of a brick and mortar store. If you walked in and there's no cash register and your arms are full of things you want to buy, that's a horrible feeling. So giving them a plan is really just about laying out what the next steps are in order for them to do business with you. So making it simple, easy as one, two, three, you're oversimplifying this on the website. That would be click shop. Now, you know, you select your delivery date and then you can eat fresh food every week without leaving your home. Those are really simple steps. Um, but just making sure that it establishes what to do next and then has success at the end. You can eat fresh food. You can have beautiful flowers to look at. You can feel healthy and strong and confident. Uh, you can show up for your community in a way that makes a difference. I mean, these are all different versions of success. So you need to pick one that's going to matter to your group. Um, so as I was just saying, success, what will life look like if they go with you? versus what will life look like if they walk away from you? And so, especially on websites, uh, that's an area that's very important is to establish like life can be better, give them a vision of the future um, if they work with you to solve their problems. Focusing on emotions is important. A lot of times we feel like we've got to focus on facts, but take a step back. What does it really mean to have a family farm in today's world. Why does that set you apart? What makes you different? Why does producing quality products matter? What are you feeling inside when you say that? Because that's probably a reflection of what your customers are feeling too. All right, so what I'd like to do now, I'm gonna stop sharing with you guys for a bit. I want to have somebody get on a hot seat real quick. And let's go through these seven steps that I just outlined to try to boil it down a bit. Do I have any brave soul that would like to go first? Anybody brave? I can go ahead. <clears throat> Rich, all right, great. Okay, so let's go back to, talk to me about your hero. What's a customer you want to clone that you'd like to have come back again and again? Or, well, actually first, let me take a step back. Um, you have the family farm, right? Yeah, it, yeah, the, the old one <clears throat> from French Canada. Okay, great. All right, so what, what does your family farm do? Do you guys sell at markets? Do you produce a product? Like, so what's the family farm do? Uh, it's, a, it's a whole uh, diet uh, farm with the exception of milk, because uh, I don't milk cow or goats. Uh, it's all the, all the remainder. And uh, I also grow <clears throat> grains and fruits for uh, distillers and breweries, uh, which is what my great-grandfather um, uh, Leonard Fauché did uh, the shit of out uh, up, up north. And um, he was a, uh, he was an indentured servant. So he was a, you've heard of the Montreal Canadians called Habs, uh, the Habitant. He was a Habitant and they brought the surf system over when he first got here. So he was, uh, you know, he was a surf working for somebody. And um, I've uh, I grew up in the '70s with uh, I, I I just have to mention the brand just so everybody kind of knows, but eating hungry man dinners and all that industrialized trash that I don't like. Um, when the family 
in the 1700s, lost their farms to the British when they kicked the French out and then moved part of the family down to New Orleans. Um, my part of the family stayed north and hidden the forests up in Quebec and then reemerged out in Nova Scotia, but the British wouldn't let them in on the prime land. So you had to stay in the essentially what French is called Bayou, which is the swamp. So it was in East Chesitcook, which is on the pretty barren area. But my family came, the family came from uh, the, uh, the shorelines of France where it was really, uh, really um, fertile. So again, at two under, you know, twice an underdog, a indentured servant gets out of that, uh, you know, two generations later, goes over to Nova Scotia, gets pushed back down because the British don't want French in the area because they're at wars multiple times. And later on around the late, uh, early 1900s, my great grandfather uh, had to leave uh, Nova Scotia because um, the, uh, the people that lived in Nova Scotia they didn't like the French Francophiles, so they put faced which was the surf system and the the english uh i'm we're facing it all now except it's called uh i hope i don't offend too many people but I, in a certain sense i don't care but industrial ag ag guys you know uh that put out this what i consider trash food and um uh you know it's a hard fight but um sometimes you need a you need a pretty uh aggressive uh 30 year marine to go out there and say we're gonna we're gonna change this whole system of it's pretty jacked up nobody likes i don't think anybody really likes an mre or a hungry man tv dinner so you know when you uh when you're when you're buying food from me and we're gonna try to do the subsistence farming model to try to give you a whole diet menu you know i uh, and uh you can taste that fresh apple that you never had before what it's really like and at the same time fight against a, a monopoly or just a really sick food system okay all right so everyone who is listening to the story um i want you to think about some of the pieces that we heard what are some of the like problems that he identified that he's solving because i heard a couple different problems Kim, the, Kim. Okay, so Kim said, "Great story. I want to buy from him." But why, Kim? You had an emotional reaction to something he said. What was the part of the story that you think you're like, "Oh wow, that's that's why I want to buy from him." I uh, I like the entire philosophy of his business and the fact that he's the business has been around for so long in farming. And that, um, you know, of course, the underdog part tugs at my heart and want to do what I can to support his mission, moving it forward so he can continue to sustain his business. What do you mean by philosophy? I, I think just the entire, okay, I should have like not participated. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I really, I think everything that he was standing for was coming through in his story about the desire to produce something that was quality that, you know, to be able to support his community and his family, community with the products that, that he's so proud of. And I mean, just the pride and the integrity shown through in his story. And the fact that, you know, he wants to do something that is nutrient dense, that helps on the health side also. And that came through, maybe not throwing in the hungry man names and, you know, but on, on that piece, but I certainly it resonated with what he's trying to do and then wanting to support the history of the farm so that he could continue to, to go forward. Yes. Yeah. And said, you know, he's earnest and passionate. Oh yeah. That got to me too. So. Yeah. So Kim's trying to be like diplomatic also when she's talking, but it was pretty obvious to me right away. It was what he said about industrial agriculture. That's what grabbed you. You're like, oh, I feel like 
because there's lots of layers in there, but that's the primary problem. I think that when he was speaking as well, that's where he got earnest and passionate about it. The underdog story is interesting, but I want you to think about that as being like salt. It's great to know that like, yeah, underdogs fighting, but it's because they're fighting against the man that they become interesting. Um, you know, that just the facts that they were a serf, interesting fact. The fact that they had to flee, interesting fact. But when you tie it in with, they had to stand up against um, oppression and against um, a lifestyle that is not right again and again. The fact that you're fighting against industrial agriculture becomes more interesting. And those that lean the same direction as you are going to be more attached because, okay, I feel the same way about industrial agriculture. Now, I don't know how we divide in this group if there are people who are in industrial agriculture versus not, um, but that is an area where it gets passionate. So I just want you to, to think about that, Rich, that when you're talking about your story, the surf and the underdog stuff becomes more powerful when you go ahead and, and talk openly about that other piece about, um, our family farm is about sustainable agriculture and that matters because all right um i, I think you did you refer to as, as sustainable what? subsistence style sorry subsistence style um subsistence style just so you know that's what we call insider language sometimes uh when you're talking to people who are new to a concept trying to distill things down into like fourth grade level concepts really helps uh, because a lot of us like if, if you don't grow up around farms you may not know what subsistence style means versus what other kind of style of farming are all farms the same which is obviously not true but some people don't ever really think about it uh, so simplifying it down to be like um, our family farm has everything you need to survive except for milk and even that's negotiable because do you need milk? So, <laughs> you know, you can use that, but the why that why you do it goes back to, we believe passionately that people should be able to uh, have easy access to quality food and not have to rely on these big industrial farms that are slowly killing us, you know. Obviously, if, if you're my client, we would get really in depth on this to try to figure out what points to highlight, but you want to make sure you have the primary problem um, just from what you were discussing. Again, we're, it's not a client relationship at this moment, but, <laughs> um, but hitting on everything that you talk about goes back to that primary problem of there's something wrong with industrial agriculture. Um, that's going to strengthen the story around. Yeah. Okay, we got some people who like quality food over GMOs. Thank you. That's <laughs> great advice. I'll I'll take that to the bank and as well as to my uh, pen and paper. Yeah. Well, good. Okay. All right. So that was fun. Does anybody want to go next to to help workshop this a little bit? How would you flip the messaging to the positive? Um, okay. So that's an excellent question, Kim. Uh, it's by highlighting what people do want, the aspirational life, essentially, like what, who do people want to be? So take myself, I'm 37 years old. Um, I live in a cute little town. It's got a cute little farmer's market, uh, but I've never, I don't have passionate feelings one way or another, except the longer I'm here and the more farmers I know, the more I start recognizing that, you know, I really do want to take better care of my body, my family, the earth. I want to make sure that what I'm doing is not contributing negatively to the world. And so again, like you could take one of those three things that I just said and focus on them in marketing. Um, and so that's why it's important to establish that hero character at the beginning, because you want to figure out what do they want? Who do they want to be? What transformation do they want to take place? Okay. Um, because we're on a journey. And so if you go back to Luke Skywalker, he's not the same person at the end of the movie as he is at the beginning of the movie because the transformation takes place on the journey itself. Um, so for me, you know, uh, if you were advertising to me, uh, a mother of children, um, the reason that industrial agriculture matters to me is because they use horrible pesticides that can hurt my children. They, um, their food doesn't taste as good. Uh, and 
you know, it's covered in wax, all those harmful additives, things like that. So you would tell us what you are that, you know, we have beautiful, delicious, um, go back to my apples. I like my apples <laughs> that we have these delicious, fresh apples that, you know, they, they come fresh picked from the farm. They're ready to eat. And you know, that they are going to help you become healthy and strong and go to bed knowing that you're not doing something to hurt. Sorry, I keep turning negative. It's hard for me to do this on my feet all the time, Kim. Um, but you just have to think about who do they want to be and talk more about what success is. And, and that, that helps them. Did that make any yeah, sense? It did. One of the things that really turns me off is when I walk into a market to a producer and he says, you need to buy from me, me, not from Kim Hutchinson produce over there because they spray and mm. they are not truly organic. And so they're beating down their competition. What I want them to say to me is I am truly organic. I do not spray. I do not do this. You know, I am ABC that's why you should buy from me. But that's me as a consumer. I didn't know if that was, you know, the marketing message that you would want to put out too. I think so. I mean, because as you said, people do get turned off by negativity. And so what you want to do is um, when you're forming a relationship, any relationship, there's curiosity, enlightenment, and then that results in connection. So saying things that get people curious to continue the conversation, the enlightenment phase is sometimes though, where we get boggled down, bogged down by like, but they're horrible people and you should burn them. <laughs> but that can turn people off because it's like, well, but that's what I was a week ago. And I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. I bought my apple at Food Lion this week. I didn't mean to do it. Um, you don't, you don't want to, to skew negative in that, in that sense. Um, but that comes back to sometimes just being more general with your terms, instead of calling out specific people, you talk about the specific evil and then what it is that you're doing that's better you can say like you know many farms spray with pesticides because they don't want the apples to look a certain way but at honey crisp farms we know that the look of the apple doesn't matter because when it tastes good you know that you're getting a nutritious apple and you can feel good knowing you're supporting your local farmers you know so you you turn it around quickly to focus more on those good things but acknowledging the bad gives you that contrast that gives that emotional through line um so acknowledge the bad but don't don't hang out there nobody likes hanging out with someone that's just going to say like over and over everything's bad they want to know how you're going to fix it how are you going to make it better how are you going to make my life better specifically that's what we're all really interested in um, i know there's a lot of selfless people in the um in the agricultural community but at the same time we all at heart we do have our own self-interest in mind one way or another. And, um, and so that's what keeps our interest. And that's, that doesn't make you bad people or anybody bad people. That just means that you're human. Uh, and so if you're gonna keep someone interested, just like you're on a first date, talk about them, get them to talk about themselves. <laughs> and that helps out a lot more. Um, and that's when you're having conversations, because conversations are still a great marketing tool, by the way. Um, having a conversation with somebody, anytime you start getting them to talk about their problems and figuring out what their internal versus external problems are, because they say, I want something, but the more you talk to them, the more you find out what are they really, what problem are they really trying to solve? Because then you know how to answer that question for them. So for Rich, you know, if he's talking to someone and you mentioned that you're on this um, substance style farm, and they're asking you questions about that, asking them to be like, so, you know, what interests you in, in buying from farmers markets anyways? Like, we're happy to see you here today, but why are you, why are you interested? And you start listening to what they're saying and you're just gonna start getting clues about what you can say back um, to answer. Because for example, when I started going to a farmer's market, it was because I had young kids. It was summer, we were very bored. And I had like three kids under the age of six at the time. And we had this local farmer's market on Wednesday and it became a weekly ritual that like, well, I wanna go and have my kids experience something new and different. And so at that time, if someone had just come out really strong to me um, about industrial farming, I, I may not have listened very much, but as I talked to the farmers and they were always really nice about asking like, oh, so have you been to the market before? Have you ever, cooked bok choy. And I'm like, I don't, what is that? What's bok choy? Um, the more that they asked me questions and found out what I was struggling with, like the reason I don't 
normally buy vegetables because I don't know how to cook them. And so then they can help solve more problems. And it formed a relationship that then drove me back to the farmer's market again and again. And then when something like COVID-19 happens, because I have a connection, uh, I'm more likely to still go back and farm and shop with them because of that relationship. Uh, it's stronger than just marketing gimmicks. Um, because things like, you know, Facebook ads and everything, they all have their place and they're great. But when we can form real connection, that's what makes super fans. That's what makes people who will try to help when things go wrong. Um, and, you know, making sure that the emotional through line continues to be there. So that was a bit of a rant on my part, but I would like to get back to workshopping with people. Um, one of our flower people, I'd love to talk to you a little bit. So there was a couple that did flowers. Who are you? You willing to come forward? This is Jan Trent. Um, I, I guess I'll be a guinea pig, but I don't think I'll be as good. <laughs> hey, there's a reason though that you said you love flowers. Talk to me about flowers. Why do you love flowers? Well, they're 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 beautiful. They smell wonderful. Um, I love flower arrangements in the house. Um, and there's also for me, there's some nostalgia because um it takes me back to when I was a kid and um cutting flowers from from my mom's flower beds and my grandma um, and grandpa would cut flowers so um i guess that's i learned to appreciate the the beauty that just the, the beauty and and they're just they're pretty <laughs> okay um i don't know if very many people disagree with you on they're pretty but i think the nostalgia is really interesting so what kind of feelings do you feel around flowers when you say like your nostalgia how do they make you feel? Um, special. It makes me feel special. Um, and um, there's joy. There's just a lot of joy with flowers. Do you think other people feel joy around flowers? I do. I do. In fact, um, I know I'm, I'm new in the business, but I know from other flor um, flower growers that I'm connected with that they had some really good years in a really good year in 2020 because it was the way people were treating themselves through the difficulties of being isolated was to just bring that that joy into their that and beauty into their home mm -hmm. i think that's definitely something people can relate to um the the thing about flowers is um I think sometimes it's easy to get caught up in when you're talking about problems, you're like, well, it's not really a problem because flowers are like a luxury item, right? It's something additional. Does anyone need a flower? I don't think so. So you might have a hard time putting yourself out there because you're like, well, but does anyone really need it? How can I market that way? But what, when I talked about the aspirational identity, people just like you crave joy. I think 2020, there's lots of reasons flowers are popular. Absolutely, we were all looking for more joy. We were also looking for more connection with people and flowers communicate emotion in an amazing way, uh, just from their colors to the way that they look when they're arranged together. You can have a happy looking bouquet, you can have a fun looking bouquet. I mean, like there's lots of different things that flowers can do, sophisticated, romantic. I mean, they go all over. And so people are trying to help communicate that. So if flowers bring you joy, that's the problem that people are trying to solve with with your flowers is that they too want to feel special and flowers shouldn't just be about special occasions because you deserve to feel special every day you deserve to have that joy every day and so telling people like using that kind of messaging to play into those same emotions that trigger you um i think that's really going to help you does that resonate at all how does that feel that feels really good. Thank you. I am here. I'm here by giving you permission to talk about joy and the fact that your flowers bring joy. Uh, Taboya, did you have a comment? I see that you um, are unmuted. I didn't. I, I just, oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure. 
<laughs> he popped up on my screen, so that's fine. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, this is something else I find with a lot of business owners too, is that you feel almost embarrassed about why you do what you do, but it's so strengthening. Like when that probably wasn't proper English, but it really does strengthen you when you can go back to why are you really doing it? Don't talk about what you think people want to hear. Talk about what you really feel because you're going to get that connection because we can think about passionate people. We like passionate people. We don't like overbearing people, but we like passionate people who really feel something. Um, that's when we talk. So it, we talked about hero in the terms of story, but when we talk about heroes in the world. It's because they've done something that we admire or we aspire to be, or because that's, you know, we've got to have something that we're reaching for all the time. And so while you may feel like your specific business is like, well, it's not a need or it's not anything super important, it's important to you it can be important to other people. And if you lean into that passion, it makes up for a lot, a lot of lack of knowledge in how to marketing and, and how to market. Um, yeah, I, I always like to say that excitement can make up for a lot of expertise. If you don't know how to do lots of things, if you're excited about what you're doing and how you're marketing, how you're talking to people, you can make up a lot of the difference because you will learn eventually. You, you're doing you know, seminars like this, you can attend things on the internet, read books. Reading books is always great. You will gain expertise. So lean into your excitement and you're gonna get better results. All right, I'd love another guinea pig. Who else is out there? Robert? Yes, ma'am. Who's talking also? And she's muted. Okay. okay. I'll come back to Rebecca then. Uh, Robert, did you? What? Yeah, I did hit it. I just didn't realize I had talk, got it on. I was trying to get it on. Um, we are in the vegetable business. Okay. And we run a farmer's, multiple farmers' markets. And what I have found, and I just was listening to you on how to do the story and things. Well, we were all, we've kind of already been doing the story to the people that come to our stands because we take the time to talk to them, fill in a question. They ask questions about, well, how is this done? And some of them really don't have a clue how you raise different things. Others are more have farm, you know, history. But what I, my point is that taking that time with them, and telling the story, well, this is the same thing I'm doing, but you're making me do it on paper or on a computer, mm -hmm. which that's what I kind of was listening to see what you put in the story. And it's just like our operation, we know where it is. It's a family farm. It's my brother and I do 99% of the produce picking and we do 99% of the sales. So you have limited contact with other people, which is a great thing in this day of COVID where everybody touching anything is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Limited number of people touching our stuff. Our farm happens to be located on top of the war basis where we don't have any cattle or anything like that to bring any type of My sound suddenly cut off. Can you guys still hear him? No. No. Uh, Robert, I'm sorry, but your sound suddenly cut off. Looks like he dropped, I think. Okay. Um, I don't know, Robert, if you can still oh, no, hear me. It's still there. That's... Robert, if you can still hear me, um, if you could just put like a one in the chat or something just so I can. See if you can still hear me. Okay. Uh, looks like he accidentally dropped out, which I'm sad because I felt like we were just starting to get to what we could work through, which is what makes his farm different with vegetables. Um, because that's what matters, you know, like, so 
the differentiator, the thing that makes you different from other farms is important, but it's usually, again, only important as it relates to the customer and how you're solving their problem for them. Um, and so I'd love to get a couple, like I just needed a couple more details and we could have worked through um, some of his stuff. But Rebecca Moyer, um, while we're waiting for him to come back, do you wanna tell me your story? And let's see if we can pick out the good parts. Oh, you're on mute. Now, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep, okay. I don't like doing this. I'll be honest. <laughs> um, I'll just throw out some things. Uh, everyone before me has said many, some of the things that I would say. Um, I'm the fourth generation to own the farm. Six of our six generations have lived on the farm um, or are living on the farm. So it's a century farm. Uh, my great grandfather raised apples, built the house, raised apples. And then his father continued with the apples and um, some milk cows just for it was all just to feed the family. But my father started with the beef cattle. He had layers and living on a farm. Um, we had a big family, five children, and my mother did all the canning. We had a huge garden, all the canning. She would send us out to pick blackberries and um, then we would help her make the jams and the jellies. So when I, I guess I have three things, the, the beef cattle, the eggs, and the jams and jellies. The two that I'm really passionate about are the chickens, the layers, and their eggs. And I love my chickens. I want to treat them as humanely um, possible as possible. I don't, they do have a house that they go into at night for protection from predators. But basically, they have the run of the farm. Um, and the jams and the jellies, I grew up helping my mother make those. And so when I'm with the chickens or when I'm with the cattle or when I'm in the kitchen making the jams and jellies, I feel a very uh, strong sense of closeness to my parents and my ancestors, my grandparents. Um, I go to a farmer's market. I have my banner with the picture of the house and the front field with the hay bales. And that just generates a lot of questions. And people like me to talk about, they, well, they'll say, what do you raise on your farm? And um, part of my story, I always tell them, you know, I had to help feed the chickens. I had to wash those eggs. I delivered them for my dad. I feel close to him when I'm doing that. And then I tell them about the jams, or they ask me about my jams and jellies, and I tell them the story. And I feel very close to my mother. Um, so we have a very strong sense of family. And I'm trying to pass this on to two of our grandchildren who live with us and are helping us with the farm. So that's basically it. Okay. All right, so you got a lot of different- I had a lot of emotions. What was that? Emotions. Sorry. Yeah. Emotions. emotions. Mm -hmm. So you have a strong sense of family. Sense of family. Yes. Yes, okay. All right, so there's a couple different directions. So you can write my story. <laughs> well, I'll give you, you some- You can help me write my story. Yeah, I'll help to give you some guidance because there's a couple different ways you could go. And a lot of this is about, there's not right or wrong. It's simply picking which direction you want to lean about what's more important. Because a couple different things I heard. The sense of family and connection to the farm itself was really strong. I definitely heard that. Um, especially because you have multi-generation like with your own grandchildren now and, and bringing that into it. 
the thing is you have to make that story matter to other people. And what's unique is that, while you may not think of this, you're living an aspirational identity for people in that if someone's lived in a city their whole life, we watch a movie and it's got people living on a farm and we're like, oh, wow, what would it be like to wake up and hear chickens and all these kind of things? And I mean, the reality is there's a lot of work. There's a lot of things that you're doing and it's, it's just a different lifestyle. But in some ways, um, you're not like you're in story brand, we refer to this as a luxury brand. And again, it may seem weird to be like, I'm not a luxury brand, <laughs> um, but it's it's referring to the fact that like, you're kind of selling the lifestyle that you have and that's what connects people to it. That um, you, for you, family has always mattered because you learned that at your parents, grandparents' knees and it was in the way that you made jam and jelly together and you took care of your chickens together because family takes care of each other. Like everything going back to family is going to create that because people who either want a strong connection with family and don't have it or people who do have it but want to make sure it lasts and carries on to a new generation are going to resonate with that. Um, and so continuously tying things back to that family is going to help to create those emotional connections. Um, and so that's one direction you can go is to, is to lean into that. The other direction is since you care so much about your chickens, um, you know, that's a, that's another thread. I think the family one's stronger, but um, having a humane relationship with your animals and making sure that they're being taken care of. And because you've lived on the farm for so long, you know how to properly do that and make sure that you're carrying on that tradition. Again, I'm, I'm convincing myself family is definitely the way you got to go on that. <laughs> um, but so in, in conversation, it sounds like you've already got that down. Uh, you know, someone comes to the market. Um, but don't be afraid to do that in print or, you know, digital means and things like that too, that, you know, for your farm, it's always been about family and it's always going to be about family. And we want to help your family, um, you know, tying that in somehow, like finishing that sentence, we want to help your family to feel that sense of connection with the earth, or we want to help your family to, um, understand how important what I guess here I've talked too much Rebecca tell me why do you think it might be important for other people to to work with your farm like to, to get eggs from you and to get jam that's been handmade by a loving family like what what comes with that well, one of the things that I grew up with, my grandparents and my mother and father always said, if you're going to do anything, you do it right. Mm -hmm. And uh, high quality. You know, we grew all of our vegetables. We ate well. Um, we lived off of the land. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want my children. I, we have offered it to our children. And now we are uh, making certain that that our own grandchildren have that experience, a healthy diet, well, okay. um, that well, the that eggs are very healthy for people to consume. Okay. And the yolks, when people break our eggs and look at them, they just exclaim about the color of the yolk and how the yolk sits yeah, up well, and all of that. Um, so also the jams and the jellies, it is a luxury item. But when they are eating our jams and jellies, my blackberries are raised on the farm. Some, most yeah, of them are. Uh, uh, they taste the fruit. Half, I four. don't dilute anything. It's the pure juice, the fruit. Um, so you are enjoying the best of the best. Yeah. Well, I think one way you can That's tie that in. I, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, you've convinced me. I want to come to your farm now. Um, but... <laughs> Some of that is about, oh. I love, oh. how you talk to, yeah, I think everyone's excited. Um, how I what? No, I think everyone's excited to like come to your farm and uh, because it's, it's really great. But the one thing that you mentioned that I think is really powerful too, is it's that, you know, your family ate well 
And, and it's like this remembered thing from the past that in today's world where we're eating microwave food and you know the hungry man dinner that Rich brought up earlier, and we're kind of we're so far removed from that. But there is this upswelling of people being like, we need to eat better, we need to eat better. Your family remembers how to really eat well off the land. And I think some something along that line, like leaning a bit into the nostalgia about like we remember how uh, you know eating simple, delicious homegrown vegetables created a healthy, strong family, you know, um, leaning into that remembering, because I, I do know, like, depending on how you're marketing, as you tell these stories, we're all just wrapped with attention. You know, we're just like paying completely curious, very much engaged with you. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, I'm very passionate about it. <laughs> yes. And you see um, that passion. I'm very passionate. Excitement. Yep. Excitement makes up for a lot. So, but getting it, um, getting it on paper is difficult for me. Yeah. Getting it on paper or video, all of that, that is, I can talk to them at the market. I can talk to people, but that's more three dimensional. But when you become one dimensional with the print, um, that's hard. I'm not good. I yeah. can't do it. So, um, so I'm going to make a recommendation to all you, uh, as I said, I'm a store brand certified guide. So I do follow Donald Miller, but his book marketing made simple, uh, as well as building a story brand are two excellent books. They just, they just released marketing made simple in paperback, uh, recently. And, um, so, but they're excellent resources for helping to weed through some of this and you go through some of the steps that, that we talked about, but when you're trying to get it down, it's, it's, it's harnessing that external, internal philosophical problem um, for a specific audience. And so if you know you need to write it, like if you're gonna put a Facebook post up, it's picturing that hero, that person, what do they really want? So if I'm your hero, because I'm a, a mother with four children who feels like I, I feed them junk all the time, if you can picture that person in your mind and think about the conversations, because you've had lots of conversations with people, what do they tell you that they're dissatisfied in their life? Like, what do they want? What are they really looking for? Um, and so if, if you can just harness it down to like two primary emotions, you know, that they feel frustrated and disappointed that they can't provide better food for their family. Um, if that's what they're feeling, that they feel frustrated and just disappointed, um, then you can solve that by saying like, I, I know, our family knows how to create good food from the land. We've been farming for over a hundred years and we know what it's like to want to feed your children good, wholesome food. Uh, and we've made it simple for people to do that with our homemade jam and our um, you know, fresh vegetables, you can make a simple meal that is nutritious and wonderful <laughs> for your family. I feel like I'm, it's hard for me too, when I can't sit here and write things and hand them to you guys. Um, but do you see that? Like, think about what's, what's the negative feeling that they're having. So you acknowledge that negative feeling that they're having, but you can make it better. That's their problem. They're, are they feeling frustrated? and disappointed? Are they feeling, um, well, I guess, what, what, do you, what do you think people are feeling that don't have what you have? Don't know. Does anyone have any ideas? Oh, sorry, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Most of the people, most of the people um, who come to the market are looking for quality products. Mm -hmm. And um, I live in Nelson County. So the market is at, uh, winter, um, brings in a lot of people from Wintergreen, Stony Creek, Charlottesville, a lot of people from Richmond, the more metropolitan areas where 
you know, they can't grow their own fruits and vegetables, but they want to buy it and take it home with them. Mm -hmm. So we're not, I'm not talking to, um, um, in this market, it's not people who cannot afford to eat well. They yeah. already eat well and they want, they're looking for quality products. Quality products. Okay. So when you say putting it in print, where, where are you probably thinking about putting it in print? Is it social media or is it someplace else? Like, where are you thinking about putting it? I, I'm thinking that I need to expand our business and market it through social media. Also, uh, probably a brochure. Okay. Of some sort. Okay. But definitely a Facebook page or a... I just got a question about, can people order from me? Go online and order. No, they can't. Um, and I'm not good with technology. And I don't like it, technology. I don't like to fiddle with it. I want to be making the jams and jellies and doing things. Um, I would rather tell all of it, talk to you and have you present something to me. And I would say, yes that captures what what i'm trying to do yeah does that make sense um, is that the easy way yeah. out no that's not that's not that is not bad um i, I will say that i have watched i'm not good at that yeah i would say I, i've watched many business owners that. that as soon as they outsource it even if it's like well i'm not sure financially i can outsource it once they outsource that part it helps them focus on the part that gives them energy and makes them excited and and things can even out. Um, so I think acknowledging that's not where you want to play is great. Um, the, yeah, so ultimately what you're doing in person, telling those stories about making jam and everything, I mean, that's what's got to get translated into the print. It's, it's telling the stories, but having the moral be, you know, like that's how we know it's quality is because we make it, we grow it, we do all of it. We've been doing this for hundreds of years. Um, that gives that authority piece uh, to it. Um, I don't know. It's, and it's see, a hard just, medium for me to enter. Let just Yeah. And just this past, last year, 2020, we expanded our farm business to sell beef. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, we chose to do grass fed. Um, this year, we have at least two of the customers so far are coming back to us and wanting more. And someone sat down in right here yesterday and said, I've been doing buying beef for a long time. You have the best beef that I've ever bought. And I want to continue. So I'm thinking, really? We do? Um, because we don't really know what we're doing. We're feeling our way along. We are in our seventies. This is a second career. And time is running out. <laughs> well, definitely I say outsource what you can. So let's uh, not take up any more time with me. Don't take up any more time with me. I'll have to hire you. Let's work on other people's problems. <laughs> Okay. Um, but one note about what she did say, she mentioned a customer told her something. Guys, anytime a customer tells you something, write it down because that's something you can definitely put on social media. Anything somebody else says about you, even if it's not a formal review, it's just like, we love it when our customers say blah. Um, or I was so excited this week when somebody said this to me, other people's words, don't be afraid to use them because they, they said them to you. I mean, you can ask permission if you want to. Um, but you know just uh -huh. recounting conversations that you've had with people and then reminding people that this is why i do what i do because we're able to deliver this quality product and we love it you know going back to your your why and reaffirming it with somebody else's words can be very very powerful um now i know okay robert are you back on because we lost you yes ma'am all right, there you are. All right, so well, you- We have our internet issue. The internet cut me off for some reason. Yeah. We've been having trouble ever since the ice storm. Uh-oh. 
I'm sorry. It comes and goes when it gets ready. I think the phone company's having it. But one of the things that I caught off of listening to Rebecca just now, she doesn't realize that, but I'm 67 years old. I don't care who knows how old I am, but I didn't know what I was doing on a computer at all. When, it's at, when I was 55, I knew nothing. I basically, I couldn't even type on anything hard. And I went to work for a company and a guy told me, he says, you will learn how to do emails. Well, I've learned it. It's nothing that can't be fixed on this thing by pushing that escape button. <laughs> <laughs> because I used to be scared to death of it, to be honest with you. I was scared I'd hit something and lose everything I had. Now, uh, I, I get in deep once in a while and have to call somebody, but uh, it's something you have to try. But I've been doing a whole lot of research at last on trying to get to reach a bigger audience is what I'm looking for. I have markets. I have people coming to the markets. But I want a potential for a whole lot more people. And just what you're seeing right here, knowing and telling people about yourself, just like we have customers come to us, the, uh, I guess the millenniums, you call them. And a lot of them know how to cook. And Ms. Uh, Rebecca, I bet she can cook anything she wants to. Even, even the jams and jellies, I understand she sells them, but I bet your husband don't go light. And I mean, that's, I had a girl come to me one day that didn't even know how to cook, uh, to cook string, but, um, what do you call it, green beans? I, I had, my wife wasn't there, so I got on the phone, called her and put them together. Well, she was raised at a place that doesn't have string beans all the time. So she didn't learn, she didn't know how to cook. But she told her right off on the phone. They jumped right up and bought a whole bunch and hey, come back more. Because, mm -hmm. and I run into this a lot that a lot of people in a certain group are not, weren't cooking, but just COVID seems to be uh, forced them into cooking. Does that, does that make sense to you? Oh yes, absolutely. Because I am a millennial myself and I have no idea how to cook. And I admit I order those online meal kits because I don't know what the heck I'm doing. So Yeah, but you can get uh, like melons. Mm -hmm. yeah, all you have to do is operate a knife and cut yourself uh, melons. And one of the ladies come to me and swears us up for the truth. She says, my kids do not have, know how to operate a knife. If I set a camel up on the table, it would sit there for a month. But if I put it in the food truck, it's gone in less than two days. All you have to do is cut it up. Yep. So well, I put things we learn talking to different people on the market at the market. And they asked us all the things. Now, there's just like pesticides. We discussed them one day when one of the customers came up, told me it was totally organic. I said, well, I'm sorry. I'll tell you, we use some. And she says, well, why do you use anything? I said, well, like this, we one year we had cabbage planted and a whole bunch of it planted. And a so book started on the end of the field and was left with nothing but stems. I said, we would have lost everything if we hadn't sprayed something. So we have to look, monitor what's out there and decide whether it's needed to be done. She said, well, that makes good sense. But you well, change the attitude a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, back to the, the concept of people not knowing how to cook, just so you know, if you're looking to expand your market, solving that problem, like saying like, you know, a lot of people would love to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but they have no idea how to cook them. Just stating that kind of a problem, you're going to get a lot of attention from people being like, yeah, that's me. I have no idea how to do that. Um, and so taking that as like, that's the problem for your hero. So how, how can you solve that? How can you make that better for them? And um, whether that's, I don't know if you, are you giving out recipes? Are you making YouTube videos? Are that's you... what we are looking at right now. Yeah. Is giving out more recipes and you'd be surprised. These ladies uh, that are in my age group that love to give a, some special recipe that their mama had mm -hmm. or something. And it's different from what today's cooking is. They just make it different. Yeah. And people go on, oh, that stuff was some kind of good. And they come back and talk about it next week. Well, we probably need to interview them at that time and yeah. put it on now. Oh, thanks. Well, I would say like, so if you're at a market, even just having a sign up that says, 
free recipe with every purchase or something just so that people know like oh wait i can get something else <laughs> um uh and and maybe ask to collect their email address or something at, in exchange for the recipe just so that um if you're interested in doing like email newsletters like that or contact the, the, the small COVID 19 was uh, uh, basically we took a had a little grill there and had zucchini and cut and grilled the zucchini at the market, you would be surprised how much the sales were. But of course, after COVID-19, that's put a quietus on that plan. And we have more days when we give out samples of cantaloupes or samples of watermelon. But mm -hmm. we dealt with a deal last year that nothing we could do about it. It's just like when we have uh, jams and jellies, we'll have crackers and you get a cracker and put your some on it like you want it. And you'd be surprised how people like stuff. I mean, I'm not surprised at all because it's try before you buy. People love that. Um, and so I'm so glad that was working. And I know the, the big problem, of course, is, yeah, markets not being able to operate the way they did because of COVID-19. Um, but as you pointed out, Robert, you know, as if you're willing to at least try a couple of things or ask people for help to get you started, you can take some of the same principles that you were doing into the digital space. Um, a lot of times we feel like we need to reinvent the wheel that if we go from being brick and mortar um, or you know in person to being online, that we have to completely change who we are, but it's actually not true at all. You can be still the same person that you are. So like Rebecca tells a really good story. Someone just points a camera at her and films her. She can still make that emotional connection with people. And it's, it's pretty simple. She doesn't need to get a fancy Facebook ad campaign going. She can just tell her stories the same way that she does that works in person. Um, and people will start being like, oh, this is really interesting. And yeah, you know, for Robert, you know, you're talking about um, like the recipes or um, letting people try before they buy. It's acknowledging in whatever way you're connecting with them. So if you have any sort of like, uh, is your market doing any online ordering or something like that? So far, we haven't got there on that. We, we've been trying to set it up all the time, but people, I call it, they like to touch the produce. Mm -hmm. Don't you think, Ted? So you, I can tell you that it's the most beautiful thing in the world, but when you see it with your two eyes, it's different. See, and that passion you just had in your voice, that was great. If you made a video where you showed two different types of vegetables and showed them like, why wow, this one's amazing, even though they can't touch it, you can do a lot to help them feel like if I was there, I would, you know. Um, but I love that, that passion you just had in your voice there, Robert. My, my, that you love to do. That I can, my voice goes up and down automatically. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm doing it. So I just get excited and get to talk mm -hmm. about that high pitched voice. And he says, I thought you, the way you sound, you were mad at the world. And I watch your face on the change. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's just a fact I have that. But yeah. I'm not taking up too much of your time, but uh, I want to set with a thought, you know, and get your feelings because I'm thinking about putting this into what I'm doing right now. I think it it sounds great. Uh, Taboya mentioned like people like subscription boxes with food. If you've recognized this is a problem consistently coming up for people, if you can figure out a way that works with what you enjoy doing, being like, maybe we should just pre-make a box that's a meal um much like subscription services online do and just being like hey we're making it easy for you you buy this box and it's got all the ingredients and a recipe for the best whatever <laughs> that you've ever eaten um i think that would go over very well i wish somebody would do that out here <laughs> yeah i'm educating anyway because my wife is always experimenting we just <laughs> had something that was potatoes and ham and cheese and all she is at this change with the original Mary recipe and adding green peas and onion. So I mean, she, and then she feeds it to me to see if it passes. So I mean, that things like that catch the right person. Yeah. I guess a good cook knows how to fix anything. Yeah, but the rest of us who aren't good cooks just want a good cook to tell us what to do. So <laughs> that's very true. I, but what that when I'm marketing, I I need to, to get my customers. In it that I well, I'm looking for more customers. Like we we're in Richmond, then and not to be no uh we have several markets in Chesterfield County. Well, it's a great thing, but the potential 
of the customers that I could get in that area, according to Facebook, I think it was like, you know, so many miles there, it was 75,000 people. Mm -hmm. They're not coming nowhere near touching enough of those people. Now, they say you get 1%, I believe, or a half percent out of the people you reach on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So you take a half a percent. That's still a good chunk of people. 700, yeah. that's like 350 people. Well, we'll probably run three to 400 a week through that easy uh, at that market. But I could do six to 700 with not much more like. Yeah. And I think if you make it as simple as possible for people to get what they want, and if you've identified that need and you have that, I think you can really reach a wider market. Uh, so. Just like with Jan, I give you permission if you need one from a marketing person. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be surprised that people that travel less this year, we also run a pick your own strawberry operation. And how far people were traveling for that pick your own, they were traveling up to 100 miles. Mm -hmm. And it's because we were still letting them pick them in the field. We were working on all the, the, the protocol. Yep. But we let people go out there and it, it, it was the honor of going to the field that was a big thing. Some one lady told me she's my kids have been going to it for the last 14 years. I don't want to miss this year. So, I mean, that's, it's, that was their big point. Yep. So they came to us. Well, I think, I mean, that's a combination of emotional connection. Like they've been doing this for a long time. So it's a memory, but also just, feeling stifled. I think over the past year, we all wanted to get out. We wanted to feel closer to something. So um, it is 2.30 now. Uh, so we've got some options. One is that I can do another hot seat and we, we can see how that goes. Two would be, I can give you another mini lesson on like some quick tips for a website. Um, if any of you have that or three, if any of you are interested in that, I should say, or three would be, we could let out early because it's beautiful and sunny. And I don't know if we're belaboring the point. So, um, so one is another hot seat. Two is that um, we'll do a mini lesson on websites and three is let out early. So one, two or three in the chat, let me know. Or you can say whatever. Ooh, got some early, yeah, early lesson, votes from me. Lesson, mini lesson here. <laughs> Kim's like, no, we're recording this. Okay, fine. <laughs> no getting out early. No, folks are saying they want the website. We've got All right. a bunch of people that want you to do a mini lesson on the website. All right, we're gonna do five tips on, um, hold on. I'm assuming the website was number two. Yes, yes it was. Um, so five tips to make the experience better on your website, or as I like to say, to convert website um, visitors to customers. Hold on, I lost my Zoom, I gotta get it back. Share and screen. All right. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Excellent. All right. So I'm just going to go over some common uh, issues with websites and uh, what you can do about them. And so if you already have a website, Hopefully you can correct these fairly easily. If you don't have one, just keep this in mind as you're plotting it out, all right? So number one is it is okay on a website to tell visitors what you want them to do. One of the biggest problems I see on websites is everyone's doing everything to explain about their business and how it's great and it's wonderful, but they don't actually have that action button so people can do what you really want them to do which is usually buy something or schedule something, right? Uh, it's not a secret, you're a business. It's okay to admit that you want people to spend money. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes we just, we are so afraid of being pushy or being too salesy that people don't want to tell customers what to do. So back when I was talking about the story, you know, there's that plan in there. Definitely if you have a website, you need to put the plan and say like, hey, if you want, your own made to order vegetable box. It's really easy. One, click the make an order button. Two, pick out your favorite five vegetables. And three, we're gonna deliver it to your home on Tuesday when we make our weekly deliveries. Simple, easy peasy. Um, but you see like on this one, it has the schedule a consultation button. 
Um, that's a quick and easy way for people to get what they want in on this particular website. Top right hand corner psychologically or like just the way that we read. Um, people read left to right in a zigzag pattern. And so, you know, they're going to go from top left corner to the right corner, then they're going to go down at a diagonal to left and right over again. And so you tend to put important things on the right hand side because it's where our eye ends. So buttons in the top right hand corner, if you can do that, if you have a webmaster already, just ask them about doing that. If you can't easily get a button up there, at least having the last item on your menu being the most important and then making it clear in the rest of the website, what you want them to do, bold headlines, that kind of thing, that will help. All right. Oh, sorry, call to action. I forgot that I had little words actually going along with this picture. Um, all right, use bold headlines to capture attention. People rarely read websites, they scan them, especially now that more and more people are reading on their phones as opposed to on, um, the, on a desktop computer. You're getting more and more people scanning even more. And so, just make sure that any headline you have is speaking to those emotional pain points like we understand or this is really easy or life shouldn't be this way or you um or if you for like jan you know you deserve joy and happiness on your table um using headlines to grab attention for those things that we're trying to help people with to speak to their problems um, and then using things like icons the reason that you use that is it just grabs the attention because the picture is different from um from the actual text you know our, our eye likes to see things broken up if it's a huge column of text we're not going to bother with it we don't have time for that okay um now you should have details on your website because SEO is real, so search engine optimization. Uh, and there are personalities that do like to get more details, but they're gonna scan first like everyone else, and then they'll go back and they'll read further. Uh, so I'm not saying to ignore the additional text, but just make sure you have headlines because that's going to help you stand out more. If somebody doesn't know what you do within the first 30 seconds of being on your website, something's wrong. Um, Donald Miller refers to this as a grunt test, like somebody should be able to look at the, the top portion of your website and know what it is that you do. Like we sell vegetables. Don't be afraid to be like that fourth grade reading level I was talking about. Don't be afraid to be simple. We feel this pressure that we need to be clever and cute about what we're saying and come up with a tagline that would work in a commercial for the Super Bowl, but you don't. You just need people to know what it is that you do and how you can solve their problem and then make it easy for them to do it. Um, so just saying like, we sell beautiful flowers that make people happy or we sell vegetables or we make the most delicious jams and jellies that are the highest quality you've ever had. That was a bit wordy, but you know, Rebecca, you can make that a little bit better. Um, just admitting, what do you do? And using it in a bold headline up at the top so people can easily tell as soon as they land that they're in the right place to get what they want. When you are picking images, pick images that show success. There's a reason that dental commercials and print advertisements have people with absolutely perfect teeth. Like so perfect, you rarely see that in a real life human being, right? Because that's what we think in our head is if I go see my dentist every six months, I'm gonna have like the perfect smile, right? Well, no, most of us would still need orthodontia and bleach and like all kinds of things to get it. But that's what we're looking for. We want success. So showing people who are happy or joyful, content, confident, um, healthy, uh, showing images of what people's lives could be like if they work with you are very, very powerful. Uh, Sometimes we're tempted to put pictures of just a thing, you know, like, so if you have a farm, it's okay to post a picture of your farm, but I would strongly recommend that you get a picture that communicates an emotion. It could be nostalgia, it could be warmth, it could be contentment. Um, that's usually more easily achieved with people in the picture, but it is possible to get some really nice 
shots. But the reason things on Instagram, people got excited about filters is because filters give a mood to pictures. <laughs> And people like to express a mood when they're doing it. So as you're picking pictures for your website um, or for social media, just acknowledge what kind of mood or emotion am I conveying with this? And is it is it conveying the right one and on your website? Is it showing success? Is this making people feel what I want them to feel if they're working with me, if they're buying my products, if they're doing what I want? Um, so if you have a limit, and I'm going to be honest with you, if you have a limited marketing budget, one of the best places you can put money is actually into photography, professional photography, because if you get a photographer who can communicate the emotion that you love um, or that resonates with what you're doing, you can reuse that stuff everywhere, websites, social media posts, print advertisements, brochures, whatever, uh, pictures, they really do communicate a lot and words are important but sometimes that picture really can say a bunch of stuff without people reading what you said and they can go together and be even more powerful so just putting in a big plug for pictures i love pictures um i forgot about the words again ah. okay so for example this is a woman eating a salad now you could have a picture of just a salad but that's not interesting this woman's happy to be eating this salad right to some people, eating a salad sounds like the least happy experience that they could have on an average day. But she looks like this is fun and nice and she's got lots of vegetables in there and that's interesting. So if you have the option, don't just put the picture of the salad, put a picture of a person being happy with the salad. Don't just post a picture of the vegetables, post a picture of someone being happy holding the vegetables. Um, so, you know, Robert, like you have these people coming and you're talking about touching the, the vegetables, just someone being excited about the fact that they get a, to hold one of those things or or checking which one's ripe or you showing it to them, that's gonna have a lot more emotion behind it than just a picture of like, these are some of our best ones because people don't associate an emotion with just a picture of the static item. So there you go. All right, if you have a website, you should have something on it that collects emails. Now, a lot of people, it was really popular probably like 10, 15 years ago, to collect emails for a newsletter. Um, and a lot of people now don't necessarily want people to subscribe to anything because they're like, I don't have time for a newsletter. But there is a second reason to have that, you know, that email lead generator is what we refer to it as. It's that sometimes you just need to talk to your customers. COVID-19 is a perfect example. If you had the email address of your regular customers, you could have at least sent them an email being like, hey, we're gonna be at this location at this time because I won't see you the way I normally would. So even if you're not planning on doing a newsletter, uh, still collecting emails can be a really wise way to stay in touch with your base. And the way that you get those emails um, is by giving them something for free that encourages them to give you their contact information. Um, this can be as simple as, you know, a free PDF download. Um, if you want to send them emails, you can send them tips. Like again, go back to Robert. If you have recipes, you offer them five free recipes if they sign up, or maybe just one free recipe if it's good enough. Um, access to like a video uh, or some sort of special discount. You do see the special discount one a lot. I know probably in um, in your field, that's, that's not as popular, but it's something that you can offer free delivery, just whatever is really simple and inexpensive for you to give to them, the easier, the better. Uh, but they, they say that an email is worth about 10 bucks. Like if you offer something that someone would have paid 10 bucks for maybe, they're likely to give you their email or if it's just something they really, really want. So, um, you know, that it can be really simple to get email addresses. You'd be surprised people sign up for things, even if you're not trying very hard, just because you offered that freebie. If you offer a recipe that sounds delicious, people will give you their email address. Uh, hold on. I think I got to the end of that part of the presentation. Um, so just another important uh, thing to go along with collecting those email addresses is that newsletter is intimidating. You think I have to write a whole bunch of stuff and I've got to do 
um, all this content. Nobody has time for that. But I want you to understand that if you do get someone's email address, it's really about reminding them that you exist. So even if you sent out an email a week with either just a recipe or just the, the date and location of where you're going to be and what you're going to bring with you, something as simple as that can help to keep that relationship going with your customer. And people say, well, I don't want to bug anyone. If you're bugging them, they will unsubscribe. They are completely in the driver's seat on that. And think about your own email inbox. Do you get emails all the time from companies that you haven't bought from in six months, but you haven't bothered to unsubscribe? The reason we don't is because in the back of our mind, we're like, well, but I might buy something from them soon. You know, I, I might want to use that discount coupon. I don't know, life changes, who knows? Um, and so we still want to be in the know. People have a fear of missing out. We're afraid that if I unsubscribe from this email miss list, I might miss something I actually want. So definitely deliver some kind of value. So if you're sending out an email, it should be something that people really do want. Um, but don't feel like you have to write a whole bunch of paragraphs and include a whole bunch of pictures and things like that. It can be simple. It can be a paragraph long. It can be a picture with two sentences. Uh, it's just something to go in people's email box to remind them that you exist. I had one client that when I first started working with her, she wrote huge emails and we'd send it out once a month. It was just this really big email. And I finally came back and said, look, can we just do, and she's actually a florist in New Hampshire. Um, and I said, what if we just highlighted like four products instead of doing a whole bunch of products on the newsletter? Like we talked about this. She had a 500% increase in purchases made through the newsletter just by simplifying and sending on a weekly basis instead of doing one big huge one once a month because it was the frequency and offering something that people are interested in you know she just highlighted four different flower arrangements sent it out and her conversion rate went way up so just keep that in mind sometimes we make marketing too complicated simple and ask yourself would i like this email if it, if it landed in my email box if I was in their position, would I like this? And if the answer is yes, just go ahead and send it. And don't, don't stress about it too much. So now I'd like to open it up for the last 10 minutes here, some questions regarding websites and the things I just talked about. So what do you guys have any questions for me on that? Jan Trent says, thank you so much. She really appreciated your presentation in the workshop portion. Um, are there any last questions before we wrap up? Suggestions for making template websites, online sales platforms look better? Okay. Um, so I love template websites. I think they are a great invention and I love using them myself because it cuts a ton of work out for me. <laughs> When you are picking a template, so if you're thinking about starting a website and you want to use like Wix or Squarespace, um, which are two template sites, if you're thinking about doing that, when you're picking a template, pay less attention to, you know, the cat, like they ask you for categories, like, what do you do? And so they give you some options just kind of go through a whole bunch of them and look at the fonts and the pictures and, and, and things like that to see if the feeling behind the website is how you want your business to feel. So, um, you know, someone like me, I can take any of the templates and I can go in and I can make it feel the way that I want. I can get the font to be friendly. I can get the color scheme to be fun. I can do all these different things. But if that's not your world that you play in, make it easier on yourself and pick a template that just feels the way that you want it to feel. Like I want to be fresh and new and clean and look for websites that feel that way to you and then pick that template to start with. Um, I, I want to feel sophisticated and and traditional and, and strong, look for a template that 
does that. And they have lots of templates to pick from most of them. So you do have to kind of weed through it, but it'll save you a lot of time during the building phase. If you start with the correct fonts, the correct colors and everything like that kind of right out the gate. Um, the, somebody had asked some more questions I thought. Uh, making them look better in, in today's world, it's really about photos. The photos make a huge difference. Um, using them more often uh, will help because if you can break up text, people, they get intimidated. We, we think, I don't have time to read all this. And yet we know from how long we scroll social media that we have more time to burn than we think. But um, it's because it's pictures. We can digest it quickly. We can stop and be like, oh, that's interesting to me. So when you, again, picking the photos, make sure that they're communicating those feelings of success that you want. They're like, oh, this is a happy farmer. Oh, this is a happy garden. <laughs> and I, I keep using the word happy, but it's the most easy emotion to talk mm -hmm. about. Um, and there are free um, photo sites. So one of them is called Pexels. There's Unsplash. And um, Pexels and Unsplash are two freebie ones. And if you use Wix or Squarespace, or Wix especially, already has access to Unsplash, um, I think Squarespace has a smaller library, but they also have stock photography that you can use if you don't have your own photos. But photos are going to help make the websites just look better, especially if they have a kind of consistent feel to them. So like if one is dark and moody and the next one's bright and happy, that's a big emotion switch. It's better to try to keep all of them feeling like they go together, like they're in a set. Um, and uh, has anybody ever heard of Canva? If you've heard of Canva or if you haven't heard of Canva, I encourage you to take a look at that. If you are someone who's, who's doing a lot of marketing yourself, you're, you're doing DIY. Um, I love Canva. I actually bought it for my team. Um, you, there's a freebie account and they have lots of resources in there, but for my team, which has the full Adobe suite and all these fancy tools, we bought the pro version of Canva for like $13 a month. It's amazing. They have a huge library of photography. Um, they have lots of great fonts and things. And so it can help you make really great social media images and they have templates or you drag and drop just to swap out the photos. Um, and so it's a really great resource if you're someone that's trying to do your own marketing. Uh, I do recommend using it on a computer desktop over using it on a phone. I have not found it particularly friendly on the phone, but they do have an app, but I would recommend just doing a computer, save yourself a lot of frustration, but it's, it's great. <laughs> it's way more friendly than a lot of the other tools. I actually have um, one of my staff who's learning how to build websites. I'm actually starting to have her do certain chunks on Canva that then we just insert as photos on the website so that she doesn't have to worry so much about different pieces because so many websites now, because we're going mobile friendly, they're built in a block format anyway. So depending on how you're doing it. Um, so hopefully that's a little helpful there. Uh, when it comes to online sales platforms, um, it, it depends on what you're selling, how you want to sell it as to which ones are going to be better. Um, because it depends on, do you have lots of variations in your product? Like, are you selling a t-shirt, but it's just in four different colors, or are you selling unique products that each one has to have its own product for? Um, I do, if you want, if you're a, whoever posted that, if you have specific questions, I'm happy to do a, a 30 minute consultation with you just to talk about what the options are and where you can go. Uh, I am a big fan of if you're selling something online and you want to use a template site, like selling a physical product of some sort. Squarespace is great for getting up and going really fast. If you're selling services, I prefer Wix because it's there's a lot more freedom and scheduling consultations and things like that are easier. Um, but there's lots of options out there. Some people, if you have a point of sale system, you may have a website thing that's integrated with that. I know people that use Square. Uh, they have what's called Weebly is the website on the back end. It's not the most user-friendly, but it's not horrible. Um, and it, you could, if you add photos, it just totally transforms the site because <laughs> they give you really limited uh, colors and text and things like that. But, you know, just uh, there's a lot possible with what you already have probably. Um, but Mary put it on 
the chat if you are interested in just doing a little consultation. I'm happy to take some time just to go over what your particular needs are and 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 work through what you can do to get going with your business. Uh, but hopefully these tips have been helpful. And does anyone else have a question for me before we wrap up? Emily, thank you so much. It has been um, so informative as always and a pleasure to listen to you and share in your energy and all of your great tips. I know we're all excited to go out there and start working on our website. And when I say we, I mean you. But <laughs> no, it was a, a wonderful presentation as always. Thank you so much. Um, the information is in the chat box on how to get a hold of Emily. We will have this video and her presentation and um, contact information and any of the other collateral information that's been presented today on the vafma.org, V-A-F-M-A.org website tomorrow. We have last, um, somebody asked if you're able to go back and look at these presentations. We did record the last two sessions. So all of the online sales, uh, the vendor management and point of sale platforms that we did, the session we did last time, um, is also on our website for you to look at. We do not have the other two available. Um, there is a 30 second evaluation that is in this chat box. I ask you all to please just take one last brief amount of time with us and fill that out before you leave. And um, let us know if you like these webinars that are free for you and you want other um, you know, us to produce others for you, please fill this out because this is what gives us the information that we need and lets Virginia State University know what you guys are looking for. Um, I'd like to just thank, um, Michael Carter has just dropped the eval into the line to everybody. While I've got you captured here, if you just take a second and go ahead and um, fill that out, that would be wonderful. Um, and I'd like to just thank Virginia State University and Small Farm Outreach, Michael Carter, for all of your support and um, working, um, inviting us to do this with you guys. We have enjoyed um, presenting all of these different topics to the farmers and look forward to being able to hopefully do this again in the near future. And um, if there is anything else that we can help you with, please feel free to reach out. And I hope to see you all at market this season. So. Um, with that, if there are no last questions, we'll go ahead and we will end the meeting. Thank you all so much. And Emily, thank you again. It was wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.